Good morning and a very warm welcome to Holy Trinity Church for this service on the second Sunday of Lent. Whether you're somebody who worships with us regularly or joining us for the first time, we're delighted that you've joined us today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. As God's people we have gathered, let us worship him together. We've set our table with candles, with the book of the Gospels from the Bible. We also place our cross from Trinity Centre at 10 on the table. As we do so, let us remember that Jesus came among us. He was one of us. Christ came to show us the way. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Today we continue our theme which we're following through Lent of worship in the wilderness. And today our focus is on a simple journey. The wilderness is not a place for excess baggage. So today we're stripping things back to some of the bare essentials. And Steve in his sermon will be guiding us through some practical examples of how we can meet with God in the simplicity of our wilderness experience this Lent. Normally we would have a prayer at this point, but rather instead of that, we're going to have a time of silence to be still before God. You'll see in a moment some words on the screen from the Psalms. And you might like to take these few moments of quiet just to focus on your posture, perhaps as you sit to have your feet firmly on the ground, to be aware of the place that you are to focus perhaps on your breathing, breathing in the sense of God's presence with you, breathing out the tension and stresses that have built up over the past week, and simply allow yourself to become aware of God's presence with you.
we pray together. We come to you, faithful Father, slowing down, taking a deeper breath. Thank you that we do not need to earn our way into your presence, but that we can come simply through Jesus by your Holy Spirit. We pause, we acknowledge your presence, we trust you to feed us by your word. Amen. We turn now to our prayers of penitence. And again, normally at this point, we would speak words to confess our sins. But today, as we're stripping things back to be simple, we're going to have another time of silence, but a silence with a very particular focus. A time to think back over the past week, perhaps longer if you wish to think about those times when you may have turned your back on God or on other people, to reflect on moments where you've perhaps been hurt or have hurt others, and in the silence to simply hold these things before God. As we see on the screens again those words from the psalm, but simplified a little, as we simply seek to hear words that assure, as we will in a few moments, that we are forgiven. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings and by following in his way, come to share in his glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we turn now to our Liturgy of the Word, we're going to begin with a video taking words from Psalm 63.
hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command a stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory in all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their heads they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Last week, we introduced the idea within our service of journeying through the wilderness with Jesus for Lent. We explored in our conversation about how wilderness worship might look different to other kinds of worship that we have experienced. Some worship is a bit like dining out. Prayers and hymns and songs and choirs and organs and liturgy are all served up to you on a plate. It requires technology, props and other people to make it happen. However, there is wilderness worship, which is quite different to all of that, particularly within a household of one, particularly when shielding. It's a bit like foraging in times. You have to have the knowledge to know what you are looking for and the skills necessary in order to survive that wilderness. It's the difference between the world of Heston Blumenthal and the world of Bear Grylls. But it all reminds us about the purpose of worship. That worship is actually not about God per se, it's about us. For we do not worship a narcissistic God who has an ego that needs flattering for an hour at a time, twice daily on a Sunday. No, through the acts of worship, God is graciously giving of God's self to be the object of our desire, our attention, our giving of worth, else we lapse into idolatry or the worship of those things, habits, behaviours, that become for us and for others life-denying rather than life-giving. 
So this week, based on the gospel account we've heard read of Jesus' temptations in Luke's gospel, we're going to look at three aspects of wilderness worship that Jesus engaged in. The first is solitude. And the first thing we notice about Jesus is that he walked away from the crowds and often spent time alone. This is the dream of most clergy. <laughs> but sadly, our colleagues and congregation, we fear, wouldn't understand. But in the passage that we've heard read, Jesus spends 40 days and nights in this lonely place. But Luke also told of another time when the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their illnesses. But Jesus often withdrew to the lonely places and prayed. We might have different responses to the idea of solitude. Some of us may be quite scared of the idea of spending time alone. We know that we are extroverts who enjoy people's company and feed off the affirmation of our friends, families and co-workers. Others of us will think that that sounds like a great idea. Bliss. Finally, a bit of privacy, a bit of peace. Henri Nguyen wrote a book about the Desert Fathers and Mothers, a group of Christians from the 4th and 5th century who revived the idea of desert spirituality at a time when the church was becoming increasingly institutionalized. Nguyen warns us against seeing solitude as simply as a quiet place to recharge our batteries and then go on with life as usual. He writes, Solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is the place of conversation, a place where the old self dies and the new self is born. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding, no friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract. We enter into solitude, first of all, to meet our Lord and to be with him and him alone. So the main reason that Jesus sought solitude was to be with his heavenly Father, how can we today choose to cut into our busy lives, our demanding relationships? Is it possible to spend some moments each week with no agenda but to be with God? Particularly for those of us who are still working full time in this difficult period. How can we see time alone as a place of transformation, where we are changed to relate to the world in a new and more godly way. The second practice Jesus engages in is simplicity. And we notice that Jesus is rejecting the unnecessary baggage. We are told in Luke's Gospel that the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Jesus knows it is so easy to gain the world let you, and yet lose your soul. So he rebukes the devil. How many of the advertisements, the media news, the party politics that surround us every day are about someone, some grouping or corporation gaining the world and achieving more authority and splendor? How often are we ourselves tempted to consume more, buy yet more clothes or upgrade to a better gadget or invest in a bigger car or decide that now's a good time to move to a better house? How often are we tempted to unquestionably support those who don't have the interests of the common good or shared environment at heart, but merely their own self-interest 
and those of an exclusive group of elites. Jesus was a homeless man. His only possessions appear to have been the one set of clothes. And when he sends out the 72 in chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel, he tells them, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. It's not wrong for us to have homes, clothes or other possessions, but Jesus' example should cause us to question whether we actually need quite as many things as the adverts or the media tell us that we do. Wilderness worship might ask us to consider whether we rely too much on things, even good things, instead of trusting in God. And maybe, if we are able, walking away from our warm homes and perhaps taking a prayer walk through local green spaces might help us to see God afresh. Perhaps putting our smartphone or tablet away for a day might give us a new perspective on life and faith. And maybe turning off the music and the TV or radio or Netflix or whatever and sitting silently in God's presence might be a form of simple wilderness worship that restores your soul more than perhaps you realise. And then finally, we have fasting. And this leads us on to one of the most obvious things about Jesus' time in the wilderness, the fact that he fasted from food. And this wasn't the 5-2 diet, where it was two days of fasting and the rest of five having normal meals. This was going without totally. And the first temptation attacks this directly. The devil saying to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And it's interesting to note that the devil doesn't say, you must be hungry by now. Even though we can all too well imagine Jesus is feeling the effects of his 40 day fast. And he goes to the real heart of the matter. If you are the son of God. So is it a gadget? Sorry, fasting is therefore not about showing people how spiritual we are or guilting God into answering our prayers. Fasting comes down to the basis of our identity. Who are we? Or perhaps more importantly, whose are we? It reminds us that more than food, our lives are sustained by the word of God by Jesus, the living word, spoken to create us and in whom all things hold together. And so Jesus responded using words from Deuteronomy that we saw on screen last week, that man should not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now that literal fasting from food continued through the time of Jesus and into the early church. And it may be that during this season of Lent, we may choose to give up some of our meal times, to spend the time that we would have been eating in prayer with God. And if you've never tried it, maybe it's a good place to start, a small place to start that can be gradually built upon. But there are also other types of fasting that we can do. Isaiah 58 talks about a fast where people choose to put injustice right. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7 describes a fast where married couples refrain from physical intimacy for a time in order to focusing on praying, not to be confused with the seven-year rich, so I'm told. But these two things could show us that we can fast in ways other than food. And perhaps the key question could be, what would be the thing that you rely on the most? Where are you in danger of getting your identity from instead of God? Perhaps it is a gadget, a smartphone, a tablet, or maybe the internet itself. Is it your social media account? Or the kind of clothes that you wear? Or the role or responsibility you undertake? Or could you fast in a positive way like Isaiah 58, 
by helping and supporting projects that help the homeless or donating financially or regularly making food donations to the local food bank. Maybe even befriending a lonely person within your community or local area. Or standing up for those who you observed are marginalised and mistreated within society. Solitude, simplicity, fasting. Three spiritual practices that can perhaps best aid us in maximizing our experience of the silence and the aloneness of the wilderness worship in this Lenten season and within these times of pandemic. So let us find ways in which we too can emulate Jesus in these practices. Amen. Thank you, Steve. We're going to try to practice what we preach now by having another time of silence now, an opportunity to reflect on the words we've just heard. Perhaps you may want to think practically about how those ideas of solitude, simplicity, silence and fasting might be something you can do practically in your life. And so on our screens, those words again from the psalm but this time simplified even more, inviting us simply to be still and to reconnect with God in the simplicity and the silence. And now in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us present our intercessions to the Father. This is what the Lord requires of you, mankind, that you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. O Lord our God, at this time of challenge and change for the whole world, we remember that your church is here to pass on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. Give grace to all churches throughout the world to rethink creatively what they say and do in the light of this simple message. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. O oh Lord, our God, may the leaders of the nations, particularly of our own country, hear the cry for justice for the poor and marginalized at this time, when many are struggling to keep their homes and feed their families. Teach us all that it is better for everyone if we share what we have, taking only from need, not from greed. Especially lead us to share the vaccine against COVID with all peoples everywhere. Give us the grace to live our own lives 
justly. Lord, hear us. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for acts of kindness and compassion that we receive and witness all around us. We ask you to bless all those who give willingly of themselves to others during this pandemic, often at considerable cost, in their jobs as health professionals, key workers and others, and in their personal lives to family, neighbours or strangers. May we too be moved to love mercy in all our dealings with others. Lord, hear us. O oh Lord our God, we remember that we are just one species in millions of forms of life that you have created to live on earth. We do not have the right to exploit its resources to the point of destruction, disregarding the balance of nature which you have set in place. Give us, your people, we pray, the humility to see that your natural laws are better than greed and lust for power. May we humans learn at last to walk humbly with you, our God. Lord, hear us. O oh Lord, our God, we trust in your justice and mercy knowing that we are dependent on you for everything that we have and every breath that we take. Make yourself known, we pray, to all those who are ill or distressed in any way this day. In our community, we pray for Liz Murphy, Sean Wade, Neil James, and continue to pray for Dick Brooks, Edith Brooks, Peter Rowland, and Jean Barron. Lord, hear us. We pray for those we know who have died recently, including Eileen Bowman, Gillian Collins, Jane Smallman, Irene Spencer, and for those who grieve for them. Also for Lyndon Fisher, whose anniversary of death is this week. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord, us. Ever faithful God, you hear the prayers of those who turn to you in faith and trust. Hear these, our prayers, that our Lenten journey may bring us closer to you and each other. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Tricia. We turn now as we reach the Liturgy of the Sacrament to the peace. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
God of our journey, as we walk with you on the path of obedience, sustain us on our way and lead us to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord is here. He is Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. You give us the spirit of discipline, that we may triumph over evil and grow in grace, as we prepare to celebrate the Paschal mystery with mind and heart renewed. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and singing. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Lord of all life. Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray for the grace each day to find space and time to be still before God and to dedicate ourselves to that by saying this prayer that our Saviour taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break the bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God here among us, light in the midst of us, bring us to light and life. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ, the Lord. To the glory of God the
aware that God is with us in this special time through his Son, Jesus Christ. So we take now a final time of silence in which to simply be in God's presence. Lord God, you renew us with the living bread from heaven. By it you nourish our faith, increase our hope, and strengthen our love. Teach us always to hunger for him who is the true and living bread, and enable us to live by every word that proceeds from out of your mouth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Lord God, make us a people who are content in all circumstances, with others or alone, with much or with little, well fed or hungry. May your presence, your provision, and your bread of life be enough for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our service today. Thank you to John and Tricia Hall-Matthews for assisting, as always, to our musicians for the lovely music today. We just spoke in our prayer then of God's provision for us, and that's the theme of our Lent course session this coming Wednesday evening. We had a really good start to the Lent course last Wednesday with, I think, over 50 people coming together, and that was led by Steve. It's my turn to lead this week, and we'll be exploring that theme, as I say, of God's provision. If you've already registered and you were present last week, you don't need to register again. You will be sent the link for the Zoom uh, gathering. But if you haven't yet registered, you're welcome to join us. You don't have to have come last week, but you will need to register for the course by this evening, by the end of today, in order to get the Zoom link for Wednesday. And if you are on our mailing list and you receive uh, the pew sheet, which was sent out yesterday, you'll find the link there, or else do go to our parish website. We hope you'll be able to join us as we gather today for Zoom Coffee, which takes place uh, starting at 11.15, I think it is, uh, and gives us a chance to share fellowship with one another, even though we're worshiping uh, separated at the moment. So now the choir will sing for us our final hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. 